Welcome back, Netrunner fans. Willing Dunn here, and I'm back to look at part two of Breaker Bay. In this video, we're going to be looking at the corporation cards in the pack. We're going to start off with a new agenda for HB. This is a three for one agenda called Research Grant. It's a research type, and when you score Research Grant, you may score another copy of Research Grant that's installed. Well, that's a pretty interesting effect, but I don't know exactly how we're going to be able to capitalize on that very easily. It seems to me like maybe you could do something with, like, shipment from Miramorph to install several of these or, or something like that. But in general, it seems like it's going to be reasonably difficult to have multiple of them in play and then score one of them and be able to score another one. It is worth noting that they do kind of cascade. So, you know, if you have all three of them in play for whatever reason, you would be able to score them all in a row. That's three points. That seems like it'd be pretty easy to win from there, especially in a faction that has, you know, the six three for twos. I don't know. This is interesting. I just don't know what the easiest way to use this would be. It seems to me like if you're going to do a sort of combo-y uh, scoring idea with HB, there were already some pretty good ways to do that in Cerebral Imaging, and you wouldn't want to play this, I don't think, too much in that deck, because you've already got plenty of other good agendas to score. I think maybe this could make more sense in the future if we see some more incentives to having a bunch of one-pointers scored, or if we see things that trigger based on scoring, or things like that. I don't know, this is an interesting card, I'm not immediately sure how to use it. Next up, we have an HB Ice that is the first of a cycle of ice that we're going to see in this pack. This one is Turing. It is 4 to res. It's 2 strength code gate. And it's 3 influence. Turing has plus 3 strength while protecting a remote server. The runner cannot use AI programs to break subroutines on Turing and end the run unless the runner spends three clicks. Well, this thing seems pretty generically good. I really, really like the mechanic of the plus three strength on a specific server, and that's going to be what this cycle of ice is all about. They're all going to be particularly strong on one given server. Now, this one as the HB ice is going to be really effective on remotes. It's going to be a five strength code gate with end the run-ish on uh, a remote server. And that no AI breaker thing seems pretty good all around. I don't think it's going to matter that much on the remote servers, just because I think that a lot of decks that play the AI breaker focused rigs have ways to get into your remotes that aren't just break your ice. So they might be planning on like vamping you or account, siphon account siphoning you down to the point where you just don't have enough credits to res your ice on your remotes. But I see this having a lot of utility, the anti-AI thing having a lot of utility on the centrals, because it's going to make it harder to like use Eater to get through with the siphon, or use Eater to get through with like a keyhole or something like that. I think this is a solid piece of ice. I think that it's going to be worth including in a variety of HB decks as like a one or two of just because it's going to be another nice large code gate. And I think HB has sort of had some issues with that. Uh, we don't have a lot of really strong non bioroid code gates. And I think most people are playing like IQ or something like that now. This might be a nice supplement to those. The ending the run without the three clicks thing, I don't know. I think that is a weakness. I think that it makes it a lot harder to try to score behind this. But especially if you're using this to, like, protect Adonis campaign or something like that, that seems really strong to me. Put this in front of, like, an Eve or an Adonis or some kind of economy asset, and this seems like a really solid piece of ice. Next up, we have the Genteki ice in the cycle. This one is Crick. It's one to res. It's three strength. It's a code gate, and it's three influence as well. Crick has plus three strength while protecting archives. 
and it has one subroutine, install a card from archives, paying its install cost. This is probably my pick for the second best of this cycle, and this is certainly immediately playable in my opinion. I think this could pretty easily slot into RP as a one or two of, just as an additional nice cheap piece of ice that can both be six strength on archives and also have some utility on like R&D or maybe even HQ if you're worried about them running it repeatedly. The recursion ability out of the archives is really good, especially if you're playing asset economy cards or cards that expend themselves or a variety of other things. I think this card really shines though in the industrial genomics deck. The genomics deck I think has been sort of floating around and one of the things with that deck is that you kind of need to defend your archives. One of the ways that people have been doing that is to put a bunch of uh, trap things in the archives. So like SheQ or Shock or things like that. And I've tried that but I just don't think that's really that good as an approach, or at least going that heavily as an approach, because it requires you to play lots of bad cards that don't really do anything else. I think it's a lot better to just make a really taxing archives and play lots of ice and play kind of more of a glacier style, and this is going to make that a little easier to do, especially if you recur something defensive. So if you're recurring like, you know, Caprice or Ash or Red Herrings or a card like that, I could see that being pretty mean, especially since they're going to have to get through a six strength code gate to avoid the recursion. The ability to constantly recur a Red Herrings or a Caprice on your archives seems really good to me. Six strength code gate, those are expensive to deal with with basically every breaker scheme. And the subroutine, while not ending the run, is enough of an impact on the game, especially in the mid and late game, where you're probably going to have to break it. So, I like this card a lot. I think it's easy to play around as the runner, and it's kind of a specialized piece of ice that feeds into some emerging strategies. Next up, we have another Jinteki card. This is an operation called Recruiting Trip. It's X to play, and it's one influence. Search R&D for up to X different sysops by title, and reveal them, add them to HQ, and then shuffle R&D. When I first saw this card uh, kind of previewed, it was just an X cost Jinteki card, and we couldn't see the text. And man, was I excited until I read the text on this card. Man, there aren't that many sysops. That's the first thing to say. Uh, if Netrunner DB is to be believed, there are seven sysops in Netrunner, and that's including a card that's been spoiled and isn't yet released. So we're not exactly talking about a lot of choices when it comes to the sysops. Within Jinteki, we have three of them. Akitaro Watanabe is definitely an option. I think that guy's criminally underplayed, and I really like him. I've played him in a lot of different decks, and I think he's pretty solid. But I really don't see you wanting to be able to tutor him up. The same is probably true as well with Tori Hanzo or with Midori, both of the other sysops within Jinteki. The most exciting sysop that I'm seeing other than Akitaro is the Twins which I think has the most powerful effect out of any of the sysops. I don't know how often you're going to want to tutor that up, but it does have some pretty good interaction with some of the Jinteki ice, making them re-encounter something like Koma Inu or something like Suruji, these very high subroutine ice that are going to be a big pain in the butt. I don't know, I think this card is probably going to make more sense when we see more sysops uh, released. I don't really see this being the type of thing that you'd be willing to include at the moment, unless you had a deck that was just very heavily reliant on one of those sysops. 
But frankly, I don't see how you would build a deck based on the available sysops around one of them. The next card that we have is an NBN asset. This is Blacklist. It's zero to res, three to trash, it's one influence. Cards cannot leave the runner's heap for any reason. On one hand, this card is kind of bad, since its effect is really, really narrow. But on the other hand, the things that it does affect are very common and are just central to a lot of runner decks. Recursion is a big part of your modern runner. Usually being able to reuse key effects is a big part of a runner strategy nowadays. And this is going to turn off a lot of those cards. So cards like Same Old Thing, Clone Chip, Test Run, Retrieval Run, Deja Vu. There's a pretty long list of cards that the runner might play to recur some of their effects. This seems particularly strong against Shaper because Shaper tends to like to recur things with like Scavenge and Test Run and Clone Chip and reuse their breakers, especially Lady or like the disposable breakers that you're going to need to replenish the counters. So this is good against Shaper, I would say. It also seems reasonably good against an Account Siphon Recursion deck, because those decks lose a lot of power when they're not able to Same Old Thing or Deja Vu on their Account Siphons. Now that said, this thing's kind of cumbersome to use, because it's going to have to be rezzed before the runner attempts to use the effect. Right, like you're going to have to have this res before they play their deja vu. You're not going to have a time to use it if they've already played the deja vu. So that alone, it's going to signal to the runner that you have this card, and they're potentially just going to be able to trash it. So I see this mainly being more of a tax type thing than being like a hard denial type effect, because it's going to be reasonably easy to trash this thing at three, if, if like winning or losing the game depends on that. But if you can build a deck where the runner is consistently forced to trash this and they have to spend that three, I could see that being pretty good, especially in some of the NBN styles that we've already seen, like Nearpad, where they already play a million cards that are really expensive to trash. So I don't know, this card I think has playability. It's a little funky, it's a little narrow, but it hits a lot of really strong cards in the runner metagame, so I see this potentially seeing some play. Next up, we have the NBN Ice in the cycle I was talking about earlier. This is Gutenberg. It's 2 to res, 3 strength Century Tracer, and it's 3 influence. Gutenberg has plus 3 strength while protecting R&D, and we have 1 subroutine, Trace 7. If successful, give the runner one tag. List card's pretty obviously good. It's going to be really expensive to deal with it if you're actually looking to break. We're looking at a 6 strength century on R&D. That's going to be expensive with basically any breaker scheme. And Trace 7 is going to ensure that it's not going to be just cheaper to beat the Trace instead of just breaking it. Now, you could just take the tag and then spend a click and remove the, the tag. But, I mean, that's still going to be a click and two credits. That's a pretty massive tax. It's going to really slow the runner down on R&D. This card is going to very easily slot into some of the existing decks. And I think making news has already been like an emerging archetype. It's kind of weird to call it emerging since it was in the core set. But I, it, it's definitely been a, a revisiting arc, uh, archetype. Like people are starting to go maybe a little bit more away from the Near Earth hub and more back into making news. And when you have access to the strong tag-oriented ice, uh, including this, I think there's going to be a lot more incentive to play making news. You're going to have Data Raven. You're going to have this you're going to have TMI and Draco and a few other cards. I think this is going to really fit into a strong making news deck. And I think even if you're not playing making news, you could still get some utility out of this. Since it's just a really cheap to res ice that's going to help R&D from getting spammed over and over. So I really like this ice. 
I think this is a good design for NBN, and I think this immediately sees a lot of play. Next up, we have a Wayland Asset. This is Student Loans. It's two to play, it's three to trash, and it's two influence. As an additional cost to play an event that there is already a copy of in his or her heap, the runner must pay two credits. This card seems really strong in a glaciery taxi style of Wayland. It's just so expensive to play around this card, and I think with adequate ice in front of it, it's going to be really expensive to trash it as well. I think it's pretty easy for the Corp to get the two credit investment back. The first time the runner has to spend the additional two, you're going to be at parity. The big thing I'm seeing about this is that it hits two really popular decks really hard. The first one is prepaid Kate because she's looking to make most of her money from events. So those events are way less powerful when you're not gaining as much money because you had to spend additional two. Also, this is just amazing against Max. Since most of the time against other decks, it, this is going to be increasing the cost of some card that's already been played. With Max, you're going to be milling two cards every turn, so there's going to be a bunch of events that hit the heap that you haven't even played yet. So this could potentially make the first time you play the event cost two more. This seems like a great taxing effect, a great defensive asset. This is the type of thing I'd like to see more of in the game. Cards that have an, a defensive taxing effect that are built into assets. I think in general, assets have been too weak in Netrunner, and I think this is a really strong effort at bringing a proactive, really powerful defensive asset to Wayland. I really hope that Wayland Glacier could use this, and I could maybe see some other flat factions use this as well. I don't know about you, but as somebody who went to college and got loans, I can definitely empathize with this guy in the picture. Choosing between what looks like ramen or strawberries, some kind of berry. I think if he was holding a six-pack of beer and ramen, he would very much encapsulate my feeling on the matter. Next up, we have the Whalen piece of ice in the cycle. This is Meru Mati. It is a two to res, one strength barrier for two influence. Meru Mati has plus three strength while protecting HQ, and it has one sub, which is end the run. This is a really unsexy ice that's just really, really solid. This is probably my pick for the best of the cycle. This thing's just such a decent piece of ice for Wayland. I really like to see them get this. It's just a good end the run piece of ice that's going to be four strength on HQ. That's good. It's cheap to res. I, I just don't see too many Wayland decks not playing this, right? Like your average blue sun deck, just switch out like a couple of your more expensive barriers and put this in. Like if you were playing something like Bastion, just switch that out and play this thing. It's way better. So I don't know. I think that this is going to see a lot of play. It's not exactly the most exciting card because it's just a random end the run barrier, but this is a really solid end the run barrier. And I am, I think this is immediately going to see play. The last card in the pack is a new neutral region upgrade. This is Breaker Bay Grid. It's zero to res, two to trash, and it's no influence. The res cost of cards in this server is lowered by five. Limit one region per server. Before we get too excited about this thing, let's make sure that we understand what cards in the server means. That means not ice, right? Ice protect the server, they're protecting. So that means you're not going to lower the, the res cost of your ice by five. That said, this card's still pretty good. You're going to be able to res things like Adonis Campaign, Eve, a variety of other economy assets for free. That seems really strong. Another thing that's limiting on this is that it's a region, 
So, like, you're not going to be able to res Sand Sand City Grid or some of the really insane upgrades because they are themselves also regions. This, this does seem really good, though, I think, just because you're going to be able to res those Adonises, Eves, those upgrades that are defensive, you know, things like Ash or whatever. This makes a card like Willow the Wisp look a lot stronger than it would in just a deck that wasn't playing Bra Breaker Bay Grid. This card seems good. I like this. This is a new, nice region option. A cool card all around. That's going to do it for my Breaker Bay review. I think this pack is pretty easily top 10 data packs of all time. I think this is going to have a lot of the impact on the metagame going into the regional season. There's just so many good cards in this pack on both sides. I feel like the Corp did a little bit better with this new cycle of really solid ice as well as quite a few other playables. But the Runner definitely got lots of good stuff as well. There's certainly lots of bombs on the runner side. I really like this pack. I think there's lots of specialized cards that have really strong uses and really strong kind of obvious uses. I think there's a, there's a lot of cards here that supplement things that already exist. At the same time, there's also some new really funky tools on the runner side that may themselves become their own archetype. This is a great pack. I think this is a must-own, and I'm really excited with what this is going to do to the tournament metagame. Well, I hope you liked this review, and if you did, please click that subscribe and thumbs up button, and I'll see you again for some more Netrunner stuff.